The glycans on the cell surface are involved in maintaining normal cellular homeostasis and just in general health. Um, if they get modified, especially in disease scenarios, they tend to get much larger and much more complex. These are ideal targets for multi-imaging, uh, especially if you have the tissues for uh, disease states. On, on the other side, it also links very well with uh, emerging single cell uh, methods to look at uh, glycan profiles there, as well as on the other end of the spectrum, clinical imaging and radiology. We're finding increasing evidence that these, uh, they're termed high mannose structures that are biosynthetic precursors to all the other complex uh, glycans that we detect are very indicative of sort of the metabolism of a tumor cell, for instance, or an immune cell. Uh, we've also seen that in particular tumor subtypes, like if it's a mucinous tumor or a neuroendocrine tumor, there are very specific classes of glycan structures that are detected in these type of tumors. So because we're using tissues that are coming around out of pathology, we're increasingly using more and more immunohistochemistry techniques to link the glycans uh, with a particular stain uh, of a glycoprotein or target. More recently, we've been looking at COVID-infected tissues and been able to link clusters of where the spike glycoprotein and immune cell clusters are with different glycans that are present. We've also started going down the path of, I'd say in pathology terms, classic tumor antigens that are carbohydrate-based, linking that with tumor as well as the glycans that we detect by the method. At the moment, I cannot think of any scenario where applying this method would not work. Uh, even if you're looking at signaling regulators, oncogenes, uh, growth factor genes, transcripts, um, anything that's changing the activity of the cell is going to show up in the glycan code also on the surface. And in particular, if you think about the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution that's going on with all the genetic models that can be made of knocking in or knocking out a particular gene, that's going to modify everything in that tissue. So also think about current cancer immunotherapies. Most, if not all, cancer immunotherapies are targeting surface glycoproteins that regulate immune function. Every one of those are glycosylated and it's already being documented that changes in the glycosylation of these targets also affects treatment outcome. So going after these uh, immunotherapy treated tissues is one of our major targets moving forward. I think the biggest misconception about starting glycan imaging starts with one word, glycophobia. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's educational. I don't think it's taught anymore, per se. Um, even if you start learning it, there's a lot of archaic terms. It becomes a whole other language and vocabulary. It looks complicated because it's not template-driven synthesis. You know, so there's just a lot of things that make people afraid of and glycans. To help people with the glycophobia, we're doing different types of outreach, whether it's web pages, seminars, presentations like this, putting information on our Glycopath webpage and our home web pages, and the partnership we've formed with Bruker on the MUSC Bruker Center of Excellence in Clinical Glycomics. So we're here to help. I think there's unlimited possibilities as far as the next five years uh, and opportunities to integrate glycan imaging with all kinds of workflows. Number one is the new instrumentation that's coming out. Uh, increasingly the, the MALDI2 platform as well as uh, improved eye mobility platforms. Glycans are great in these workflows and this type of instrumentation. So I think it's gonna keep getting better and better 